You know what Dolores was talking about? I was going to ask you, you mean there's nothing wrong with wearing pajamas at Walmart? <laughs> I guess that's not fashionable. <clears throat> <laughs> How many of you have seen that before? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. How many of you did that before? Oh, oh, oh all the hands are down. <clears throat> all right. Tell someone Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. The tour portion today. Bahukotai, which means what? What does it mean? In my statutes. Which way do we want to go? How many of you want to be blessed? And how many of you want to be cursed? I didn't see too many hands that wanted to be blessed. <laughs> Maybe I should. I don't know if you have to think about it or not. But as I said, Bahukotai means in the bait. Remember, like in the beginning, Bereshit, the bait is almost always in or by, something like that. Chuk is uh, statutes, and the I on the end is my. So that's where you get in my statutes. All right. Now, what are we supposed to do? Let's look at. Now, remember last week, it was all about the Shemitah cycle and the Jubilee cycle. Remember? And this week, look at this. If you walk hukotai, in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, I want you to realize we are to do three things. Number one, we're to walk in his statutes. We're to keep his statutes. We're to do his statutes. And so we have to realize these are like three different things. He's not repeating himself three times. He's giving us three concepts of what we do with his statutes. One of them is that's the path we're to walk in. That's why in Jeremiah it talks about walk the ancient paths. These are very ancient. These paths are like 6,000 years old. Uh, even Adam and Eve were to walk in God's statutes. Noah was to walk in God's statutes. And so his statutes really began long before Moses. And then we're to keep them. Does anyone remember what keep means? It, can, it doesn't mean do. What does keep mean? Protect them. Like you keep your grandma's dishes safe and a cabinet kept away. So we're to be walking in his commandments. We're to be guarding the commandments, and we're to be doing the commandments that are meant for us. A vast majority of the commandments don't apply today for you at all. So we can keep the commandments, not letting people throw them away, break them, trash them. We're to guard them and say no. Now, much of it we can't do. Why? Probably 70% of the commandments can only be done in the land of Israel. So you can't even do 70%. So I don't know why people get so upset. <laughs> they don't apply to them anyway. But, the, but you see the concept. This is why I'm so against people trashing the commandments. You can't do with them anyway, the vast majority of them. Okay? Because they're only, like the Shemitah year, only applies to the land of Israel, not to Algona. Okay? <clears throat> and, and, and so this is why, why are you so upset about the commandments when they don't even apply? You don't even live in Israel. Okay, the second one a reason why people shouldn't get all upset, there was laws that were only for the priests. And guess what? The Gentiles, you're not priests. Why are you upset about all the laws against the priests? They don't even concern you. And then you have the laws for women. Well, men can do those. And they have law for men. And women don't do those. So when you really think about all these commandments everyone gets so upset about, they don't apply today because there's no temple. And so hello. There's, there's no temple. You're not in the land, okay? You're not a farmer. Some of the laws were for farmers. Some of the laws were for judges. And so I just don't understand why people get so upset about all of these, this, they call it a big heavy load. They don't even apply to you. So what's your problem? You know, I mean, really. And, and so there's only like a few, uh, few of them. All right, here's, yeah, I don't want to be gross. I don't mean to be gross, but it's like the, the laws of, of, uh, not having sex with the same sex. Well, they get around that by saying, oh, I just changed my sex. I'm Noah. <laughs> Hello. But I mean, who would be opposed to those laws? I just don't get it why people are opposed to, some of, uh, to the laws of God, except they are lawless. So let's take a look here. Leviticus 26.4. Look what happens 
if you, well, it says all over the Torah, if you do walk in my statutes, you'll prosper. So how come all these churches that teach uh, prosperity don't teach anything about following the Torah? That doesn't make sense either. Okay, but look at this first one right here. He says, I will give you rain at the right time. Now, how do you know California hasn't had rain for a long time, but then they get rain and it floods? Okay, so you want rain at the right time. You don't want rain during the harvest. You want rain before the harvest. And so God is saying, if you do what I tell you, I will control the rain and give you the right amount at the right time. And so the land will yield or increase. And look at this. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Wow. So here you got not only rain, but God says, if you follow my statutes, your trees will bear fruit. Not just a little bit of fruit, but lots of fruit. And then look what it says in verse 5. It goes on and says, there will be bread in full measure. So look at this. You're also going to have bread, but not just a little bread. You're going to have, oops, you're going to have the fullness of bread and peace in the land. Look at this. And you will be living in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land. Has Israel ever dwelt in their land safely? No. No. Do they have peace in the land? No. Why? Because they're not walking in his statutes. That's why Israel, Tel Aviv is the, number, is the homosexual capital of the world. All right? So, yeah, so you have to realize Israel is not at peace. They're at war externally as well as internally. You see what's going on internally in Israel, just like what's going on internally here in the United States. But it says you'll lie down and no one will make you afraid. Wow. And then it says, I'm going to remove harmful beasts from the land. And that not only refers to the animals, but people. Okay. And the sword will not go through your land. You are going to chase your enemies. They will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred. Okay, that's one person will chase 20. But then look at what it says. A hundred of you will chase 10,000. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. So here we see one person will chase 20. All right. But one out of 100 uh, is what the next one is. So what does that mean? That means the more unity Israel has, the more victory they'll have. That is huge. And so what we need to realize is how do we increase our individual impact is by joining with others. OK, that's why the devil has always wanted disunity in the church, because you you can chase five people on your own. But if with a group, you can chase 100 people. That is huge. But I, people don't realize how we need each other. It's just to increase your power. Let's look at Deuteronomy for a minute. Chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. Let me see what I meant. <clears throat> it says, it'll come to pass. If you listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will not only come upon you, they're going to overtake you. Can you imagine? It's like a tsunami wave coming. And a tsunami wave of blessings, a tsunami wave of blessings that overtakes you. How many of you want God's blessings that not only come upon you, but you're drowning in blessings? Wow, the only way that's going to happen is if you do what it says, if you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. Okay, so now look at Deuteronomy 28, 8 through 10. The Lord will command the blessing upon you. Heck, that's a commandment. He's going to command the blessing. You go and you come upon that person. And in your storehouses. And in everything you set your hand to do, he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he's sworn to you. If, if, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God, you walk in his ways. And everyone on earth is going to see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they're going to be afraid of you. That is a powerful verse to think about. 
Now, look at this. You ever have a, uh, read a verse that you're shocked is in the Bible? You thought, boy, that, that is unbecoming of the Bible. <laughs> well, guess what? God is just as much, uh, Yeshua is just as much human as he is God. How many of you know Yeshua literally walked among the people of Israel? Uh, now, I really believe Yeshua was manifested in the flesh on earth way back then. Moses talked to him face to face. I think Yeshua literally was there talking to him, and he was literally walking throughout the camp. Think about that. I have proof. I have proof. Did you know that? Look at what the Bible says. In Deuteronomy. No, first, we're going to go back to our Torah portion. Leviticus 26, 11 through 12. God says, I'm going to set my tabernacle among you, and my soul will not abhor you. I will walk among you and will be your God, and you'll be my people. Now, that's the first thing right there. Now, people think, well, God spiritually walking. No, it's Yeshua who's physically walking. Let me prove it even more. Are you ready? Let's go to Deuteronomy 23. Okay, here, here's a nice piece of land with some beautiful leaves. You're out in the wilderness, right? And look at what it says. I want you to have a place outside the camp and you shall go out to it. And it says, look at my picture. You're to have a trowel with your tools when you sit down outside. And he says, you're to dig a hole with it and turn it back and cover up your excrement. Why? Because the Lord your God is walking in the midst of your camp. I don't want to see it. I don't want to step in it. It's right there. He says, look, I am walking. See the picture? He's walking through the camp. And he says, turn it over. Bury it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to smell it. I don't want to step in it. Can you believe that's right there in the Bible? Have you ever, have you ever seen that before? Okay. And he says to deliver you and give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and then turn away from you. Oh, my goodness. The camp of Israel stinks. I'm out of here. Okay, moving on. Leviticus 26, verse 13. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. Can you imagine? He says, look, I'm the one who freed you from slavery, okay? And so you're not their slaves, you're not my slaves. And I want you to do what I'm telling you to do. Well, I would think we would be grateful. How many of you want people to do things you ask because they don't want to do it anyway, but they feel obliged. Well, they'll forget it. I'll have someone else do it. Well, it's the same thing with God's commandments. He's commanding us, and we should say, yeah, great, all right, woohoo. Not complain and whine. Look at Ezekiel 34, 22 through 24. The Lord says, I'm going to save my flock. They will no more be a prey. I will judge between cattle and cattle. This is like in the last days when he judges between nations, the sheep and the goats. He says, I'm going to judge between those who call themselves my sheep and those who are not my sheep. And he says, I'm going to set up one shepherd. He will feed them. Even my servant David, he will feed them. He will be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I the Lord have spoken it. Okay. When was David alive during the time of Ezekiel? Absolutely not. He's been dead for hundreds of years. So when he's speaking about this, he's speaking about the millennial reign. That's, and that tells you uh, the resurrection of the dead is true right there. Okay, so then what does it say? It says, uh, Ezekiel 34, verse 25 through 31. Let's look at what the rest of the verse says. And I will make with them a covenant of peace. Remember the covenant of peace? Pincus, 
when he shishka bobbed Hophni, <laughs> remember, in Zimri, he gave uh, Pincus a covenant of peace. And here he says, I will make them a covenant of peace. I will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely. This is what we were just reading in Leviticus. They'll dwell safely in the wilderness and they're even going to be able to sleep in the woods. I mean, everybody wants to sleep in their house. They feel safe. Who wants to sleep in the woods at night? There's lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Okay. And evil people. Those are the evil beasts. And then he says, I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. Wow, that's what we're just reading in Leviticus. And then it says there will be showers of blessing. Can you imagine? You know, it doesn't rain. I mean, it rains here in Seattle, but it doesn't really rain like it rains over in the south, you know, or in the, I mean, we have buckets and buckets of rain coming down. And here he says, it's going to make showers a blessing and the trees of the field will yield their fruit. And the earth will yield her increase and they shall be safe in their land and shall know that I'm the Lord when I've broken their yoke, the bands of their yoke. Look how all of this is ties together. It's just being repeated over and over the concept. And he says, I'll deliver them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them and they will no more be a prey to the heathen. Neither will the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely and no one will make them afraid. Israel would always say, God just brought us out to kill us. All right. Well, God's saying, no, that's not true. Okay. I will raise up for them a plant of renown and they will be no more consumed with hunger in their land. Neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people says the Lord God, and you, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are mankind. And I am your God, says the Lord. This is why in Jeremiah, I believe it's 31, where God says that no, it might be in Ezekiel, but no longer will they say that the mountains of Israel are going to devour us and kill us. They've always had a rebuke against the land. And so God wants them to know the land wasn't there to devour them. The land was there to bless them. The problem is they need to change their attitude. Now, look at this. We'll go back to the Torah portion, Leviticus 26. But if you will not listen to me and not do all the commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you will not do all the commandments, but that you break my covenant, I will do this to you. I will bring, or I will appoint over you terror. Consumption, the burning og, that shall consume your eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you will sow your seed in vain, for your enemies are going to eat it. Now look at all these I wills. You can't say, oh, the devil, look what the devil's doing. God says, no, the devil's not doing this. I'm doing this. He says, I will set my face against you, and you will be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when not, no one's even pursuing you. And if you will not yet for all this listen to me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heavens as iron and your earth as brass. So they can't be blaming the devil for all these tragedies. All right? So here's the thing. We can either have blessings overtaking us, you know, a lot of big blessings. God says, it's your choice. Or we can have curses. And I mean, lots and lots of curses. And then he keeps saying, and if you don't want to do it, I'll do it seven more times. Seven more times there'll be curses. Look at this. Leviticus 26, 20 and 21. Your strength will be spent in vain. Your land will not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And then look at verse 22 through 24. I will also send wild 
beasts among you, which will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, make you few in number. Your highways will be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by these things, but will walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you and will punish you even seven more times for your sins. And then look at verse 25. I will bring the sword upon you that will avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, I'm the one who's going to send the pestilence and you'll be delivered into the hand of your enemy. And then verse 26 through 28. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, 10 women shall bake your bread in one oven and they will deliver you your bread again by weight and you will eat and not even be satisfied. And if you will not for all of this hearken to me, but still walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you even seven more times. So you have seven times, and then 49 times, <laughs> and then take 49 times seven, and 350 times. Wow. And then look at verse 29. Look at this. This is just incredible. And you will eat the flesh of your own kids, your sons and your daughters you're going to eat. Why? Because... There'll be a famine in the land. And when your kids die and you want food, well, you will eat your kids after they've died. That's what this is saying. And he says, I will, I will, not the devil will, I will destroy your high places, cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul will abhor you, and I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. Now, do you remember when this happened? We're going to say roughly 1300 B.C. is when this was written, okay? Let's say it was written around 1300 B.C. Well, what happens almost a thousand years later, this actually comes to pass. That's how you know there's a God. Only a God who lives forever can fulfill his promises millennia later. Here it is in Jeremiah, the destruction of Israel by Babylon. And God says this, I'm going to make this city desolate and the hissing, everyone that passes by will be what? Astonished and hiss because of all your plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And they will eat everyone the flesh of his own friend because of the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. And so they're going to be just stuck in this one city. Well, God prophesied that that was going to happen. And they kept not walking his commandments. And so now it happens. And then uh, look at Deuteronomy 28, 36 and 37. What does it say? The Lord will bring you. And the king, which you shall set over you. They didn't even have a king yet. Unto a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there shall you serve other gods, wood and stone, and you shall become what? An astonishment, a proverb, a byword, among all the nations where the Lord shall lead you. Wow. It says there'll be an astonishment in Deuteronomy, and then again in Jeremiah, we see there was astonishment when it happened. And then look at Leviticus 26, 32 and 34. Do you remember the week before we were learning about the Shemitah cycle, the Jubilee cycle? God says, and I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein will be astonished. There it is again. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land will be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath. So think about this. How long were they in captivity in Babylon? And why were they in Babylon for 70 years? They didn't keep the seventh year for how many years? What, 70 times seven? 490 years. And if you go back 490 years, it began when Saul became king. Exactly, to the year. They, the entire time of Israel's kingdom, even with David, even with Solomon, they never let the land rest. None of them did. None of them did. And then, yeah, it says, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. 
that tells you God wants the land to rest. Now, when you think about it, how many years has it been since the land rested? Now, it's been several, well, I don't know, it's hard to tell. I, you know, there weren't too many people in the world back then, I guess. But uh, I think the land definitely uh, deserves about a thousand years of rest coming up. But look at this again in Leviticus 26, 35 through 39. As long as the land of Israel lies desolate, it will rest because it did not rest in your Sabbath. When you dwelt upon it and upon them that are left alive of you, I will send faintness to their hearts in the lands of their enemies and the sound of a shaken leaf will chase them and they'll flee as fleeing from a sword and they will fall when no one is even pursuing and they will fall even upon one another as if it were before a sword when no one's pursuing. You will have no power to stand before your enemies. You will perish among the heathen and the land of your enemies will eat you up. And they that are left of you will pine away in their iniquities in your enemies' lands and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Wow, how many of you? Okay, now if I had to stand here, okay, do I want curses or blessings? I think they all would say blessings and yet they chose what caused the curse. How many know that as part of human nature? I'm going to lose weight as I'm eating my donuts. <laughs> we know that that doesn't work. All of us know what's right and wrong, but we decide, oh, uh, you know, I'll put it off. It's human nature, guys. It really is. It takes a lot of willpower. So look at 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21. And of them that had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill, look at this, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. This kind of tells us, wow, a thousand years have gone by. Well, actually, yeah, about a thousand years have gone by from the, when the commandment was given to when it actually took place. Now, did they say, well, the Torah's done away with? It was a thousand years ago. Uh, I don't think so. It's never done away with. Let's look at Leviticus 26, 40 through 42 to find the answer. What is the solution? Even after we've messed it all up? If they just confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they've trespassed against me, and that also they've walked contrary to me, and that also I've walked contrary to them, and I'm the one who brought them into the land of their enemies. If then they're uncircumcised, what? It's always about the heart, okay? He talks about this in the Torah. Can you believe it? Circumcision of the heart is in the Torah, okay? And uh, then it says, let's see, if they're uncircumcised, hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity. Oh my goodness, now that's a whole nother thing. We might say uh, to the judge before the court, you know, I'm sorry that I killed that person. I acknowledge my iniquity, but I won't accept any punishment. That doesn't make sense either, does it? We have to not only acknowledge our iniquity, whatever punishment God wants to give us, all we can do is say, bring it on, you know, and ask for mitigating circumstances, or I ask that you would, you know, take everything into consideration. But the key is here is they not only have to confess their iniquity, okay, in the, uh, in the iniquity of their fathers, it says, Leviticus 26, 40 through 42, if they confess their iniquity in the iniquity of their fathers, Wow. And I think that has a lot to do with replacement theology. I think Christians need to repent of thinking the church has replaced Israel, but also with our early church fathers who started all of this. We need to repent of that. As a matter of fact, there's a verse, I can't remember if it's in Jeremiah or Isaiah, but it says uh, the Gentiles are going to come and say we've inherited lies from our fathers. That's what this is talking about. Okay, it says, then they, if they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember and I will remember the land again. 
Well, look at 1 John 1, 9. See if anything's changed, as if the new covenant, New Testament means everything's different. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nothing's changed. They had to confess their sins back then in the Torah. It wasn't all they got to do is kill an animal and I'm good. Everyone thinks that Jezreel thought if they just killed a lamb or a ram, then their sins were gone. That's never what they thought. That's like a blood libel. Many people say, well, the Jews, they want to kill the non-Jewish children to use their blood in making matzah. How stupid. They're commanded not to eat blood, for heaven's sake. But uh, there, people just assume all of these things. Uh, they've always believed they had to confess their sins to be forgiven. Okay. Think about, I, I want to make things practical. Let's say someone committed some crime, but even selling massive amounts of drugs or whatever it is. And let's say he has the death penalty coming. And he's begging the judge for mercy. And so if a judge in his mercy suspends the death penalty, maybe he's life in prison without parole or something. But if he suspends the death penalty, would that mean the one who committed the crime could now think he can continue to do it and mercy will be extended? No, he's thinking he got lucky the one time, but now he's in big trouble. Well, so many Christians think that they can continue in their sins. It doesn't work that way. If God in his mercy has forgiven you and even had his own son die, that doesn't mean it gives you the green card to go and continue on in your sin. Does that make sense? Where does Christianity get this from? I have no idea. Okay, and then it says, uh, look at Leviticus 26, 44. And yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, so now they're in Babylon or where else, he says, I will not totally cast them away. I won't abhor them. I won't destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I'm the Lord their God. In other words, God says they may break their end of the covenant, but I will never break my end of the covenant. Look, go back to Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, I will also search for my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he's among his sheep that are scattered. So I will seek out my sheep. I will deliver them out of all the places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. This is referring to the tribulation. And he's going to be gathering all of his flock that have been scattered. And then look at verse 15 and 16. God himself says, I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie down. I will seek that which was lost, bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken, strengthen that which was sick. I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. Wow. What, is it? what do you mean the fat and the strong? He's talking about the fat and the strong who haven't been feeding the flock. They've been fleecing the flock. That's who they're talking about. All the religious leaders... He's going to destroy that have been feeding on the sheep rather than feeding the sheep. That's what this is saying. Look at Matthew 15, 24. He answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is Yeshua himself fulfilling Ezekiel 34, 15, and 16. That's what that is. That's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Ezekiel. Look at John 10, 11 through 14. I am the good shepherd that is talking about in Ezekiel, he's saying. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leap the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them. And what does he do? He scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, and he doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Wow, that is amazing. So this is the leaders. The leaders of congregations or hirelings, they just are doing it for the money, the paycheck, kind of like the Sanhedrin back in Yeshua's time. Well, we'll lose our place. We'll lose our nation. They're not in it to feed the flock. They're in it to fleece the flock. So look at John 10, 16. This is an exciting verse. Other than the sheep of Israel, what is he saying? Hey, guess what, guys? Other sheep I also have, which are not of this fold, referring to the Gentiles. 
them also I must bring, and they're going to hear my voice, and there's going to be one fold and one shepherd, and that's Jews and Gentiles grafted in together with one shepherd over all of us. Amen? Yes. Amen. Let's stand. Now, because we are finished with this book, we always say this at the end of every book, so we're going to stand, we're going to say this, and then we'll pray together. Kazakh, Kazakh, Venit, Kazakh. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Amen. Yeshua, right now. Father God, we thank you for sending Yeshua. And we just pray right now that each one of us in this time would become strong. We wouldn't become fearful. We'd become strong because we know how this is all going to end. And Father, we just want to sacrifice our lives for you. We want to sacrifice our lives for the sheep. We're all in on this. Father, we are all in, and we just thank you so much that you love us so much, and all you want is for us to take the light of your Torah to the nations, because it's not about us, it's about you. It's about your kingdom, and we every day we're praying, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. Well, we're the ones who do your will, and so Father, we're the ones who want your kingdom to come, and your kingdom is going to be one of light, one of Torah. And so, Father, I just thank you right now for all those that are here locally, all those around the United States, all those around the world who want to sow into your kingdom. This isn't ours. We're just the vessel. We're just here to shine. We're not that light, but we want to shine your light to all of the world. And I thank you, Lord, for all of those who help participate in blessing you and helping us to find your children. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us a life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. We checked our Facebook and YouTube uh, accounts, and we see that we have people watching right now from Israel. Yay! Barbados, South Africa, Canada, England, Kenya, Switzerland, Australia, Chile, Holland, and Nigeria. I mean, that is just amazing. And we have 44 of the 50 states watching. Yay! All right, are you ready? I have something special for y'all. As you know, two weeks ago, what did we talk about? Blemishes. And then last week, what did we talk about? Spots. Does anyone remember the three spots? Can anyone tell me what the three spots were? How do we know if we have any spots? What are, can anyone tell me one of the three spots? Two of the three spots. Surely I'm not talking to walls. Anybody remember? What are the three spots? Okay, oh, at Matthew got one, the heir of Balaam. What else? Okay, Korah, the gainsaying of Korah and the way of Cain who killed his brother. Okay, so the three spots, when it talks about in Ephesians, he wants a body without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. The three spots are the way of Cain, the era of Balaam, and the gainsaying of Korah. Can anyone tell me one of the blemishes? What are some of the blemishes that we have we need to make sure we don't have? All in the Torah. A big nose or a flat nose. A flat nose, which speaks of no spiritual discernment. What else? A blemish in the eye. A blind, completely blind. A dwarf or a midget. Okay. The broken hand, broken foot, hunchback. Okay, all right. It's all coming to you, right? All coming back slowly but surely. Today we're going to talk about wrinkles. Could have spot wrinkle or blemish. 
Oh, let me see. Okay. Now, not only am I going to talk about wrinkles, I'm going to go over how to get rid of spots, wrinkles, and blemishes. We're going to make this practical. Okay, so today it is wrinkles. <laughs> how in the world we got wrinkles? He says, I give up. These wrinkles just won't iron out. Well, what are wrinkles? They're like a crease or a fold of the skin caused from either folding or shrinking. You know, if you have someone who is robust and then they lose a whole lot of weight, they got some folds of skin, wrinkles. All right, well, we're going to start with what the Bible says. What a concept. <laughs> Here we go. We're going to start with Job. Look what Job 16, 8 says. You have filled me with what? God tell, Job is telling God, you have filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me. There it is. And my leanness rising up bears witness to my face. I thought this was the perfect Job picture. But... Interesting. Wrinkles involving leanness. That kind of makes you think of a robust person who's gotten very skinny and there's all these folds and wrinkles in their skin. All right. One of the things we have to find out first is in Hebrew, there are different words for fat. All right. What? There's a lot of different Hebrew words for fat. And so we're going to begin with that. Okay, one fat is from your Strong's 1878. The Hebrew word is dashen, and it means to anoint. Isn't that interesting? Look at Proverbs 2825. He that puts his trust in the Lord will be made what? Yay! But what does that fat mean? That fat means basically here that will be anointed. All right, we're going to walk in his anointing. Look at Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the diligent shall be made what? Fat. But it's the Hebrew word dashen. Okay, so we have to realize there are different, this is what's so bad about English. They have five different Hebrew words and they translate it with one English word. But they're five different things. This is why English is not the best way to look at your Bible. We're going to look at another fat. Here's the next fat. It is chaleb, and it means the best, the richest, the choicest part. Let's look at that. In Leviticus 3.16, all the fat is the Lord. This time, the word fat is this. In other words, the Lord is supposed to get the best part, the first fruits. We don't give him the scraps. In other words, if you have a bunch of sheep and one of them's blind, oh, God, we'll give the Lord that one. No. The Lord is to get the best part. Now, look at Genesis 45, 18. You shall eat the what? The fat of the land. This is Caleb. You're going to eat the best of the land. You're not going to get the scraps. You're going to get the best of the land. But now let's go to Genesis 4, 4 and look at the problem between Cain and Abel, what the real thing was. It says in Genesis 4, 4, Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat. In other words, Abel brought the best, Cain bought the garbage. He did not bring the best in his offering for the Lord. That's where the problem was. He didn't bring the first fruits. He kept the first fruits for himself and offered the Lord what was not the fat. Is it helping us understand now, here's the next one. Tophish. Look at this. How many of you would put a load of plywood on your little car? This word fat means thick-headed, fat-headed, dumb. Okay? You ever heard of someone who's fat-headed? Thick-headed? It comes from the Hebrew. Look at this. In Psalm 119, verse 70 through 72. Their heart is as fat as grease. 
okay, that's, but I delight in your law. In other words, people whose delight is in the law of God, their heart isn't fat like with grease or thick-headed. They're smart. The others that don't follow the Torah are stupid. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Wow, that's interesting. It was good for me that I've been afflicted so I could learn your statutes. Wow. In my statutes is today. And we get afflicted when we don't learn his statutes. But the thing is, if you remember from the Torah portion, we're supposed to learn. God punishes us so that we learn. And then if we don't learn, he has to punish us seven times more. Hopefully we'd get it then. But some people don't. They got to get punished seven times more. And they keep getting mad at God. And all God is saying is, just do what I'm telling you to do. And it won't happen. It's that simple. And then it says, the law or the Torah from God's mouth, instruction coming from God's mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Why in the world would people say his laws and statutes are done away with rather than keeping and guarding them, doing what you can do is beyond me. Now there's another fat. Here's another Hebrew word for fat, and it's shaman, which means to shine, to be oily or gross. Okay, let's look where that is used here. Look at this. Their heart, well, we saw it's as fat as Greece, and now we're going to go to Deuteronomy 32, 13 through 50. It says, he made Israel to ride on the high places of the earth so that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him suck honey out of the rock, oil out of the flinty rock, butter from cows, milk from sheep. And then when it says, with the fat of the lambs, that's the Hebrew word that means the best. This is a, this is a diff, this is the other Hebrew word. He made them eat the fat of the lambs, that's the best of the lambs, and rams of the sons of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys and wheat, and that's the different Hebrew word, meaning the best, chalev. And then it says, you drank from the blood of the grape, but Yeshua grew fat. See, in English, it's all fat. But this is a different Hebrew word. In other words, here, they ended up growing oily, gross, and they kicked. And then it says, you grew fat, that is oily and gross. And they were satisfied. You know what happens? People don't seek God when everything is great. They don't need him. They only seek God when everything goes bad. And so what do we see happens? They forsook God who made him. And they lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Wow. So when you're reading the Bible in English, you have to realize there could be different Hebrew words behind five different Hebrew words. And they use one English word. So this is why you have to be careful as you're reading. But can you imagine they forsook God because they were satisfied? But as soon as things get bad, they turn to God until things get better again. Look at 9-11. 9-11, everyone was turning to God for about two months, and then they forsook God again. Now look at Revelation chapter 3.17. And he's speaking to a church. And he says, because you say, I'm rich. And increase with goods, and I have need of nothing. They don't even need God anymore. We don't even need God. We're self-sustaining here. And God says, but you don't know you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 18 through 20. You forgot the rock who brought you forth, and you ceased to care for God who formed you. This is why it says, honor your father and mother. God is our father. And the way you treat your natural father is going to be the same way you can treat God. And it says, and the Lord saw and despised them because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I'm going to hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very perverse generation in whom is no faithfulness. Here they are. It's like God wants to speak or their father wants to speak and they want nothing to do with them. They just turn their head and they want to go their own direction. I always thought this was fascinating. In Luke 18, 8, it says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It says, the greatest generation, I believe, in all of history on earth was the 
Moses' generation that got to see all the miracles. They saw all the miracles. And yet God said they were a faithless and a perverse generation. The next greatest generation on earth was a generation that lived during the time of the Messiah. And he said they were a faithless and perverse generation. And now when he returns, he's saying, will this also be a faithless and a perverse generation when he returns? Will I find any faith on earth? Look at Psalm 78, 40 through 42. It says, how often did Israel provoke God in the wilderness and grieve him? That just broke his heart. In the desert, they turned back and tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. They didn't remember his hand nor the day he delivered him from the enemy. Now, how powerful is God? And yet you can limit him. It just says you can limit God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Did you know you can limit God? I'll tell you how. By not doing what he says, then he can't bless you. You've limited him. He wants to bless you uh, like with a tsunami of blessings, but you're limiting him by your behavior. Many people don't realize that. Just like you can't force anyone to love you. You can't force, I mean, they Nebuchadnezzar tried, you know, or whatever. You can always try to force people to love you, but then it's not love. That's why we will always have a free will, even in heaven, guys. You will still have a choice to choose. Isaiah 17.4. Now watch this. It'll come to pass in that day, the glory of Jacob will be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Okay, so here's someone who's robust, and then all of a sudden, they're full of wrinkles as they're waxed lean right away. You following me? Do you know what this is a prophecy here in Isaiah 17 that hasn't happened yet? It's yet to happen? Isaiah 17 is when Damascus is destroyed and will never be inhabited again. And it says this is when Israel is going to destroy Damascus. But it says in that same day, they're going to be made very thin. Okay, there, there's going to be a big devastation in Israel. That's what's coming. But this is what causes wrinkles. Look at Isaiah 17.10. It goes on to say, Because you've forgotten the God of your salvation and you've not been mindful of the rock of your strength. We hear this pattern going over and over all throughout the Bible. In other words, we don't want to forget God. Now, some people think, I'm not going to forget God. I'm going to put him in my pocket and I'll pull him out whenever I need him. You know, no. We need to be remembering every morning. We need to get in the habit of every morning realizing, and that's why the Modei Ani, thank you, God, for waking me up. That's why it's said every day. So we remind ourselves we're submitted to someone else. We're not the boss. How often people say, you ain't the boss of me. No one wants to be under authority because no one wants to be told what to do. But we all have to realize there's someone who made us, and we best not forget him. <clears throat> Part of the problem is we think we're above God's law and the commandments. There either isn't any or we're above the law. Now, look at Psalm 106, 10 through 12. God saved Israel from the hand of him that hated them, and he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy, and the waters covered their enemies. This is talking about the Red Sea here. And there was not one of them left. Then... Believe they his words, they sang his praise. So it's like right here, after the Red Sea, Israel was jumping up and down, hooray, the enemies are gone, we survived, and they praised him. Okay. But then what? Look at verse 13 through 15. Very soon they forgot his works. They didn't wait for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. They tempted God in the desert, and he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their souls. They're fat in the flesh, but lean in the soul. Spiritual wrinkles. It's like spiritual wrinkles where, where we rely on the flesh, where we walk in the flesh, we're full of the flesh. Fat in the flesh, but God sends leanness to our soul. Look at Amos 8, 11 through 12. 
Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, I will send a famine in the land. But it's not going to be a famine of bread. It's not going to be a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I believe that is happening right now with the woke church and a lot of these churches that are talking, but they want to be your life coach. They don't want to tell you the word of God. They don't know it. They just want to make you happy and feel good in your sin so you'll tithe. I mean, that's what it is. They want to keep you fat and happy. Never convicted. And so a man, it says there's going to be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. There'll be thousands of churches, but you're not going to hear the word of the Lord. You'll be hearing the word of man. And they're going to wander from sea to sea, from north even to the east. I think it's interesting. It doesn't say north to south. It says north to the east. But east is where Judah is. That always goes first. And they will run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, and they're not going to find it. There's a time coming when God is going to leave. And no one's going to hear the word of the Lord. There's going to be some people trying to hear the word of the Lord, but all they're going to hear is how wonderful they are. Look at Psalm 103, 17 through 21. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him. It's not upon those who disobey him. So many of the church say, I can disobey all I want and I get mercy. Don't work that way. The mercy is upon them that fear him and his righteousness to the children's children to such as do what? Keep his covenant, remember his commandments to do them. The Lord, to not remember them so they remember them. Hey, I remember all the commandments. Yeah, well, how come you don't do any? It says then, the Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. So bless the Lord, you his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all you his army, you ministers of his that do what? Their own pleasure or his pleasure? His pleasure. Look at 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Wow, that is the key. Look at Daniel 9, 4. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that what? Wow. And to them that keep his commandments. How do we know we love him? If we keep his commandments. Look at John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. First John 5, 3. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You mean I can't steal from Joe? Come on. Oh, please let me kill Betty or whatever. I mean, how can, it, that is so dumb. His commandments are so grievous. Man. Jeremiah 2, 32. As a maid forgets her ornaments, or can a maid, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Do you think at a wedding, the bride's going to forget her wedding dress? No. Uh, no. And yet he says, my people have forgotten me days without number. Can you imagine? We forget God. How can we, without number? I think, you know, and again, this is just me. I, we got our emotions from God, which means God has every single one of our emotions. He gave them to us. Some people think God is like some celestial computer in the sky, some AI, and he never has feelings. God has feelings. Where do you think we got our feelings from? And uh, can you imagine, how many of you, one of the biggest thing is, does anyone know me? Does anyone remember me? If I die, is anyone even going to remember me? All of us want to be remembered. None of us. Look at all the big memorials people build for themselves, name cities after themselves, bridges after themselves, all kinds of things after themselves because they all want to be remembered. Well, if there's anyone worth remembering, it's God Almighty. And yet, how do you think he feels when he's forgotten I mean, there's no love loss there. I mean, it was like, wow, we don't even, 
We remember what we care about, what we love. That's what we remember. And so for me, and, and it's just me, maybe I'm crazy, but sometimes I like to think that I can fool God and I'll wake up and I, good morning. I bet you didn't know I was going to say that, you know. But, I, you know, when I think of uh, how people forget God nature without number, one of the funnest things I like to do is just all of a sudden talk to him. You know what I mean? I, to me, I think it brings joy when we do remember him. Obviously, if he's upset, they forget him. You know we bring him joy when we remember him. Wow. Can you imagine waking up? Well, I remember you, God. That's how we need to be. We need to become like little kids again. We really do. And just say, hey, God, I'm going to go here or go there. Uh, I want you involved in what I'm doing. Keep me safe while I'm driving. You know, and if I miss a turn, it's like, well, you must not have wanted me to turn there. I don't get upset at the loss of time that I have to make up when I miss a turn. I just, I mean, I've had so many things happen, divine appointment kind of things, that I just know it was God. I think I've told you guys this one time, but not everyone is here every time. I'll never forget one time I go pull up to a gas station and I'm getting gas. And I love cleaning out my car at the gas station, throwing stuff in the trash. And I go to throw this thing in the trash. It's like a receipt of some kind. And the wind blew it over to the right onto the dirt. You know, do I want a litter? No, I don't want a litter. So I bend down and I hate bending down. I'm getting old. And I bend down and I pick up the thing and I go to throw it in the trash again and it blows it the other direction. Oh, crap. You know, I go, I go, I bend down, I pick it up, and I look, and there's a lady's purse that was left behind sitting on the ground. And I made the thing, uh-oh, someone lost this, and I pick it up. But I don't trust people, so I didn't necessarily take it into the gas station, but I opened it up, I saw the person's name, I saw the address is close, it's like 7 in the morning. I drive over to their house, and I knock on the door. You know, and this guy, this lady answered the door like, who in the world are you? I go, hey, here, I found your purse. Oh, yay. You know, but God directs our steps. And so we can't be upset when things go different from our plans. So you have to realize God may have another plan. And so we have to realize every day of our life to get God involved with what we do. And it makes it so much more fun. It really does. I like to have fun. Okay. And then it says, uh, as I read last week, Ezekiel 16, 11, God says to Israel, I decked you with ornaments and I put a bracelet upon your hands and a chain around your neck. What is the chain he put around their neck? Anyone remember? The, the Torah, the commandments. And it doesn't say a tire chain around your neck. No, it was a beautiful bracelet. So, I have here, does God's grace blot out the law? God's grace says you're forgiven for breaking the law, but don't do it again. God's grace doesn't blot out the law. It just, he allows you, okay, to not do this. But what happens if you continue to do it? Grace disappears. But so many Christians believe they can continue and sin all they want because they got the get out of hell free card from Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Let me give you a perfect example. How many of you heard the fact that people say, well, I don't need to do that. Jesus fulfilled it. I mean, you heard that before? Okay. What happens if two, you tell your child to do something and they say, I don't have to obey you, dad, because Jesus obeyed for me. Is that going to fly? <laughs> so why do Christians think it's going to fly? It isn't going to fly. Okay, so you don't break God's laws. They break you. Isn't this kind of different than what you've heard before in the past? <laughs> now, how do we get rid of them? How do we get rid of spots, wrinkles, and blemishes? Are you ready? The first thing you have to do is identify the problem. We got to get to the root of it. Here's the root of it. I got someone here washing their hands with soap and water. Is that going to get rid of the problem? Okay. Listen to Proverbs. No, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2 and verse 23. It says, though you wash yourself with an acid 
and you take much alkali, how much, you know, too much acid and too much alkali, both will tear your flesh apart. And this is saying, though you use that, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord. The strongest soap, the strongest alkaline will not get rid of your sins. The strongest acid will not get rid of your sins. The reason why, he says, is because it is marked. And I'm going to explain marks. But first, you have to know, you cannot get rid of spots, wrinkles, or blemishes with wrinkle remover, blemish remover, or kaboom, spot remover. None of those will get rid of your spots, wrinkles, or blemishes. When he says marked, the Hebrew word means to be carved, to be inscribed indelibly. Just like the, the Jews had the number tattoos on their arm. Okay, well, this is even more than that. This is cut into your flesh. It's like your sins have carved your heart. So if it's been carved, soap and water isn't going to get rid of that face on the wood. And that's what he says. God says the problem you don't understand is your iniquity has been engraved. So soap and water doesn't work. In um, Proverbs, 16 verse 6, how are we going to take care of our iniquity? It says your iniquity is marked. Look at Proverbs 16, 6. It is by mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. We don't fear the Lord. That's why we don't depart from evil. Mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Wow. We have to acknowledge our iniquity. We have to tell the truth. So many of us think we can lie to God. <laughs> like, that's pretty dumb. You know, just tell them the truth. Acknowledge your iniquity. And then, but also, I think we need to be showing mercy. Remember what God said. You show mercy to someone else, and he'll show you mercy. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. The servant of the Lord must not fight, but be gentle to everyone apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to what? The acknowledging of the truth. This goes back to our Torah portion. We, we can't repent of something we don't acknowledge is wrong. And then it says, uh, if peradventure, God will give them repentance to acknowledging of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who has taken captive by him at his will. Now look at our Torah portion. Again, Leviticus 26, 40 through 42. What does it say? If they confess their iniquity, the iniquity of their fathers, with their trespass, that they trespassed against me, that they have also walked contrary to me, and I've walked contrary to them, and I brought them into the land of our enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, only then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. Isn't that fascinating? This is why I like to bring that back up again. So the whole thing comes down to disobedience. We are disobedient. I think that's, you know. And then look at Jeremiah 3.13 again. What does it say? Just acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God You've scattered your ways to the strangers under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice. How many of you remember Saul in 1 Samuel 15, when God tells Saul to kill all the Amalekites, okay? But he spares Agag, he spares the best. The first, the best is what is supposed to be sacrificed, and he saves the best for himself and for the people. And then Samuel comes. And Saul says, I have obeyed God's voice. Well, your idea of obedience is a little different than his idea of obedience. And do you remember what Saul's answer was? His answer is really quite funny. It's a play on words. And he says, and why do I hear the beating of the sheep you didn't kill? What is the word for hear? Shema which means to hear and obey. So here he says, I've obeyed. And he says, then why do I hear the sheep? I hear, okay, but it's hear and obey. 
You heard. How many times do you tell your kids to go dump the trash? And they go, I heard you. I heard you. And what do you say? I don't want you to hear me. I want you to do it. And that's the same thing it is with God. He wants us to have ears to hear and then do what he says, not disobey. Look at Isaiah 4, 3 through 4. It'll come to pass when he that is left in Zion, the one that remains in Jerusalem, is going to be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord will have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and will have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. It's called the refiner's fire. God is going to refine us. In Corinthians, it talks about people who build with wood, hay, stubble, and others who build with gold, silver, precious stones. And what happens? When the heat comes, the gold, the silver, the precious stones just get more pure. But the wood, hay, and stubble burn up. But it says in Corinthians, they're still saved. It's like you were in a burning house and you got saved from the burning house, but now you have nothing to show for it. And so that is what's going to happen to a lot of believers. There are a lot of believers who've been building with wood, hand stubble, they're going to be saved, but they're going to have nothing to throw at the Messiah's feet. Can you imagine? How, how do you like to go to some birthday party and you forget to bring a birthday gift and everyone's bringing a birthday gift and you're kind of there, uh, uh, you forgot to bring a birthday gift. How many of you want to be at the crowning of the Messiah when he's crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And everyone, believe me, you're going to want to bring a gift to that. And here, you're going to be, everyone's going to be coming, throwing their gifts at his feet. All the people they've led to the Lord or all the people they've discipled. Because everything else is going to be burnt. The only thing that's going to be left is relationships. That's all you're going to have. The Lord is not interested in your gold or silver. He can make that in two seconds and let there be gold and there's gold. Okay. The only thing you're going to have to present to his feet is those you've led to him. Think about it. What else is he going to want? He wants his sons and his daughters. That's what he wants. I mean, believe me, our life isn't worth that much. <laughs> but in one sense, it is. He died for us. But <clears throat> we have to be careful how we're building as believers. It's, it's going to be, what we're going to be laying at his feet is not only what I said, but also the funds that were spent toward building his kingdom. You know what I mean? How did we build this kingdom? Did we support Israel, his kids? Or did we not support Israel? Did we help the fatherless? Did we help the widows? Did we help the poor? You know what I mean? So it's, uh, it, it's a whole lot of things. What we're going to set before him is what we've allowed him to do through us. It's not what we did for him. It's, don't think it's what you do for God. It's not. It's what you've allowed him to do through you for him. Does that make sense? His reward is going to give each one of us a reward based on how much we've allowed him to work through us to build his kingdom on earth. That's what it's going to be. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Who's going to abide the day of his coming? Who's going to stand when he appears? Can you imagine when he appears? A lot of people say, boy, I want it to be just like the book of Acts. Well, I don't know. Ananias and Sapphira died for lying. Uh, it's going to be. Look at this. He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We're all going to be purified. The question is, what's going to be left after we're purified? That's why in Revelation 1, 5 through 6, and from Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that what? Loved us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's made us kings and priests to God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We have to realize he did not save us to kill us. 
He did not bring Israel out of the desert or out of Egypt to kill them. It was, he brought them out to bring them in. And we have to realize that God as king, but he's the king who loves us, but he loves it when we obey him. That's how we show we love him, by keeping his commandments. Not by saying they're done away with, they're trash, they're no good. And realize most of the commandments aren't, don't apply to you anyway. The main commandments is that we love them. Wow, that's tough. I don't know if I can do that, God. So with that, let's stand. And we want to give all of our hearts to him.